In this video we will discuss the P1.5 waves topic. This is part of the Unit 1 exam for physics, or the Unit 1B exam for additional science. So the first thing we need to understand is what is a wave. So a wave is a means of transfer energy from one point to another without there being any transfer of any substance between the two points. So a wave just transfers the energy, but it doesn't transfer matter. The wavelength is the distance between one peak to the next. So you can see that, that will be from here to here. Which I'll highlight on, on there for you. That's a wavelength. We depict that with a symbol lambda. Okay, the wavelength is measured in meters. The frequency of a wave is the number of waves that pa pass a fixed point in a given time. So the number of waves passing a fixed point per second. We may measure frequency in hertz, which has the symbol HZ, as shown, shown down here. The wave equation <coughs> relates speed, frequency, and wavelength. And we can find out the wave speed is equal to frequency times the wavelength. Speed must be um, given in the units meters per second. Wavelength is recorded in meters and frequency is recorded in hertz. The rearrangements for this equation are shown down here and here. This is a triangle. Remember that in the exam you'll be given an equation sheet. It's always best to substitute the numbers into the equation first and then try to rearrange later. The next thing we're going to look at with relation to waves is electromagnetic spectrum. Within the electromagnetic spectrum there are lots of different regions. You'll be familiar with visible light because this is a part of the spectrum that we can see. Above visible light we've got gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet. Below visible light we have infrared, microwaves and radio waves. Within the electromagnetic spectrum the energies and frequencies are proportional to one another. So the higher energy waves will have the greatest frequency and therefore the shortest wavelength whereas the lower energy waves will have the highest um, wavelength and the lowest frequency you need to be aware that the um, the three parts of the spectrum above visible light are known as ionizing and that's because they can turn atoms into ions they also can cause cells to become mutated and they lead to things such as tumors developing and that can go into form growths that can lead to, to cancer. Below ultraviolet, the rays in the um, EM spectrum are, are non ionizing and therefore they do not cause cancer. You also need to know for the exam that EM waves can be used for communication. You need to be aware of four parts of the electronic spectrum that can be used for communication. These are radio waves at the bottom, okay, and they're used for TV and radio signals. You also need to be aware of how um, diffraction effects are used so that we can diffract the radio signals around things like hills so that you can hear a radio s a station if you're in a valley or beyond a hill compared to the transmitter. You also need to be aware that microwaves are using mobile phone and satellite tele um, television and those signals can pass through the atmosphere to satellites that are in space and that tr information is then transmitted back to the earth. Infrared radiation is using remote controls. So when you're sat on your settee and you want to change the channel on the TV, you can press remote, remote control and that information is transmitted through the infrared radiation from the remote control to your TV and that causes the channel to change. Finally, you need to be aware that visible light is used to communicate through things such as photography. This next slide shows the electronic spectrum. It also shows in there how uh, we get an increase in wavelength as we go down the EM spectrum. So that radio waves have the highest wavelength and gamma rays will have the shortest wavelength. Whereas if we um, increase the energy, what we do is we increase the frequency as well so the wavelength gets shorter. So radio waves will have the lowest frequency and gamma rays will have the highest. You need to be aware that all electronic waves, including visible light, travel at the same speed through a vacuum. That speeds the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times 78 meters per second. They are all transverse waves and they all have an electric and magnetic field oscillating at right angles to the direction in which they travel. We will look at um, transverse and longitudinal waves later in this presentation. On a previous slide, we looked at how radio waves diffract around obstacles so that we can hear them in, when we're in a valley and there's a hill between us and the transmitter. What we're going to look at now is how diffraction actually works. 
Diffraction occurs when a wave spreads out from a gap or bends around an obstacle. You can see here that the wave, wave fronts are all coming in towards this gap, but when they strike the gap, you'll notice that they end up curving afterwards. So the wave fronts will go in in relatively straight lines to begin with, and as they pass through the obstacle, they will begin to curve. Things that you need to be aware of is that diffraction is more significant with low frequency, longer wavelengths, which is one of the reasons why radio waves will diffract, where other forms of the EM spectrum won't. When you draw your diagram, you need to try and make sure that the distance between the two waves, remember that's lambda, is the same before and after the gap or obstacle. Remember that as, it, uh, as diffraction occurs, the waves become sort of curved in themselves, as you can see here. If we were to widen that gap and have the same wavelength, what we would get is that the waves would curve less. We'll look more like that. You need to be aware that diffraction results in the energy of the wave spreading out, and you also need to be aware that for a wave to diffract through a gap, the wavelength of the wave should be a similar order of magnitude to the gap size. So that means that the wavelength be between the wave fronts should be about the same size as the gap size. Another property of waves is that they will reflect. You need to be aware that the angle of incidence, I, is equal to the angle of reflection, R. So whenever a wave reflects off a surface, the angle of incidence is always the same as the angle of, in of reflection. You'll notice that we've got a dotted line going here, that's called a normal. It's a perpendicular, so it's at right angles to the, the object or surface we're reflecting from, in this case a mirror. You can see that the angle of incidence comes in here, on this line. It strikes the mirror, the normal is drawn from where the ray strikes to the mirror. I remember that it's a right angle. And then what we see is that the ray itself will be reflected and come down this way here. Now you should notice the angle of reflection, this angle there, is the same as the angle of incidence there. You must remember that the angles are measured with respect to the normal, and the construction line, which is the normal itself, is perpendicular. The reflecting surface. In this slide we're going to look at how images are formed by a plane mirror. So the moment we have an object up here, which we've got RL, what we notice to, to try and show how this image is formed is we're going to draw two lines coming from RL, okay, and they're going to strike the mirror. They'll be reflected so that remember the angle of instance is equal to the angle of reflection. So we get the yeah, two reflected rays coming out here. Now for us to be able to see our image, we need to extrapolate the lines backwards. So if we imagine that we were, were down here, if I just quickly draw an eye on. Okay, there's my eye. Okay, now I'm looking at those two rays, where would I see them coming from? Well, I would see the two rays coming from, if I extrapolate those lines back, coming from these points here. That allows me to form my image. These are construction lines, so they're imaginary rays, because the real rays don't come from there. Um, but they allow us to see where the image would appear when looking into the mirror. You will notice then that the image produced by the plane mirror is the same size as the object. It's the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front of it. In terms of this distance here, they'll be the same. It's upright, so it's got the same orientation, okay, in the vertical plane as the object, but it's back to front when compared to the objects, we call that laterally inverted. Okay, so the idea is that it's flipped about the horizontal axis. So mirror image, you often hear people say. The final thing we need to know about images formed by plane mirrors is that they're virtual. They're not real, they only exist inside the mirror. Just below here, we've got a few notes on, uh, on real and imaginary or virtual images. So real images are images that are formed where, where light rays cross after reflection by a mirror or refracted by a lens. Real, real images can be cast onto screens and an example of that is, is something that you see in a projector. Whereas virtual images are formed where light rays only appear to form okay, and that's because they've been reflected by a mirror for example or they've been refracted slightly by a lens. A virtual image cannot be cast onto a screen an example includes those that are formed by plane mirrors. 
The next property of light we're going to look at is refraction. Refraction occurs when waves change speed as it passes from one region to another. This change of speed usually causes the wave to change direction. So you can see that water waves, I'm showing this example here, water waves coming along, um, they slow down as they pass from, over from a deeper to a shallower region. So you can see that here they're in deep water, they're going to enter a shallower surface here, and they are refracted. Light slows down as it passes from, an air, from air into glass or perspex into water, and that's because those substances are more dense, so again it will slow down. So refraction of light at a plane surface. Okay, we can see here from the diagram that as light comes in, this is the angle of incidence this time. Remember that the normal is drawn at a right angle, at a right angle to the surface that we're reflecting or refracting from. The angle of incidence will enter here, it goes in. For some reason, it's not exported properly, so that you know the the angle of refraction should should start here. Um, but we can see the angle of refraction is is less than. If you imagine that ray, I just draw it on here. The angle of refraction is a theta there is less than the angle of incidence, and the reason for that is that the um, the light has slowed down as it enter, as it entered the glass block. As it slowed down, it's bent towards the normal. When light leaves the glass block, it enters air again. It's going to speed up, and that causes it to bend away from the normal. So remember that light bends towards the normal, so the angle of, of reflection, refraction is less than the angle of incidence if the density of what the light is traveling into is greater. Whereas if it's going from a more dense to a less dense material, the light will bend away from the normal and therefore the angle of refraction will be greater. In this slide we're going to look at the differences between transverse and longitudinal waves. The first diagram that we can see at the top here is for transverse waves and transverse waves such as light or all the, the regions of the EM spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, are transverse waves and that they occur when the displacement of the wave is at right angles to the direction the wave propagates in. So you can see here, it's probably this, this idea is probably best. You can see the wave moving like so. Okay, so that's the, the idea of what the wave would look like. You can see that it's oscillating up and down here. So it's moving up and down. Whereas the wave itself is traveling in this dotted line across there. And therefore, they're at right angles to one another. A longitudinal wave occur when the displacement is parallel to the direction of the wave. So for example sound waves and the direction of wave movement in this case is back and forwards. Okay. Um, so the wave movement goes that way but the the thing that's causing the oscillation goes backwards and forwards so you can see that they're parallel to one another. If you ever ask which type of wave has both transverse and longitudinal waves then the example you should give is seismic. Going to a brief look at sound waves here. So sound, wa sound waves are longitudinal waves which cause vibrations in a medium which can be detected as sound. The loudness of sound is increased with the amplitude of the sound wave. So you can see here that we've got a, a, a quiet wave where the amplitude, so remember that the amplitude is measured from the equilibrium line, so there's the amplitude there, A. We see that's relatively small compared to our loud wave which has got a much larger amplitude. And remember that the amplitude is measured from the peak to the equilibrium line. If we're going to discuss pitch of a musical note, well that will increase with frequency. So you can see here, we've got a low pitch sound in this case. And that's because the frequency of the wave is lower, but the, the wavelength then will be greater. So you can see here we've got a larger wavelength, lambda. Compared to this example, where our lambda will be smaller and therefore use a more frequent wave. So the higher frequency, the higher the pitch, the larger the amplitude, the louder the sound. We're now going to look at the Doppler effect. The best way to think about this is as a point source related to a sound wave, such as where an ambulance travels. As so you can see that in this diagram here, <coughs> unfortunately the animations haven't passed across very well as this format I'm using. 
but you can see that, that we've got a build up of the sound wave. So if you imagine that the sound at A, you can see that the, you've got the red circles moving out from there. But as the ambulance begins to move forward, the circles of different colours begin to, to move around in the same sort of way. So they're always a circle each time. What you'll notice as the ambulance travels forwards, in this direction in this case, is that you can see these circles are getting compressed. So its wavelength actually gets smaller. You can see a small lambda there. Small wavelength. Okay. Um, but a larger frequency. Whereas if we look at the, the back sound waves, you can see that their, their wavelengths themselves, lambda there, is increased, it's greater, it gets greater still, the further away we go. Um, but its frequency then is decreasing. So the Doppler effect basically is summarised that if a source is moving towards you, its frequency will increase and its wavelength will decrease, so it sounds higher pitched. Whereas if the source is moving away from you, its wavelength is increased and its frequency is decreased, and so therefore will sound like a lower pitch. So the Doppler effect also apl uh, applies to light waves. Okay, and we can see that we've got um, with light waves. What will happen is if their frequency increases, then they will appear more blue. Because remember, if you think of the the spectrum, reds got the highest wavelength, blues got the lowest wavelength, and therefore the highest frequency. So as light waves become more frequent, they become bluer. And that's known as blue sh blue shift. So if light's moving towards you, it's blue shifted. It appears bluer. If light's moving away from you, then its wavelength will increase, its frequency decrease. If it's got a longer wavelength, it will appear more red. What we notice about stars is that they tend to be red shifted. So you can see in this example that all these peaks in this spectra that we've got here have been shifted in this direction. So you can see that one's gone there, that one's gone there. They've all moved across the direction I mentioned. And so we call that red shifted. So the lights move towards the red part of the spectrum and away from the blue part. So the wavelength has got longer, the frequency decreased, and therefore it's become red shifted. This then means that the light of a red shifted object is moving away from us because it's got red shifted, and therefore we're looking at it as though we're behind the moving object, so the light or the source that's producing this light. It's moving away from us. So when we look at galactic redshift, in 1929, Edward Hubble discovered that the light from distant galaxies were redshifted, which means they're moving away from us. He found that the redshift was proportional to the distance to a distant galaxy. So the further away the galaxy was from us, the faster it was moving, because the more the light was redshifted. Therefore, the more distance the galaxy is away from us, the faster it is moving away from us. And therefore, that means that pretty much all the galaxies we see are red-shifted. So they're all moving away from us. So if we went back into the past, then they would have been closer to us. And we can extrapolate that back to get one of the most famous scientific theories of all time. So the most famous scientific theory, or one of the most famous scientific theories of all time, is the Big Bang Theory. And so Hubble's observations tell us that distant galaxies are receding from us. And the further they are away, the faster they are moving away from us. So the idea came that the universe expanded, because if we went back in time slightly, then the galaxies would be closer to us. If we go back in time further still, they'd be closer again, closer again, until eventually you've got all the galaxies being next to one another at one point in time. So the Big Bang Theory is an explanation of the origin of the universe. It states that the whole universe was in a very small, hot, dense point. And it was in that hot, dense point nearly 13,500 million years ago. And then expansion started from there. And the universe has continued to expand after originating from a very small initial point. So part of the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, we've already looked at the red shift, which has provided evidence for it. But another part of the evidence for the Big Bang Theory is something known as the CMBR, which is Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. This was first discovered in 1965. And when the Big Bang occurred, it produced very short wavelengths of gamma rays high energy radiation, that as space has expanded, this radiation has, has cooled, is stretched and got much longer, and is now in the form of microwaves. 
The presence of this radiation throughout the universe is evidence that supports the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is the only theory at the moment in time that can explain the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the final part of this <coughs> presentation will look at the evidence versus the interpretation for the Big Bang Theory. So the first thing we'll look at is that light from the other galaxies is red shifted. The other galaxies are moving away from us, which is supported by the Big Bang Theory. The further away a galaxy is, the more its light is red shifted. So the most likely explanation is that the whole universe is expanding. That supports the theory that the start of the universe could have been from a single explosion. And finally, We've got cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR, and that is that the relatively uniform background radiation is the remains of energy created just after the Big Bang Theory. And remember that CMBR, or cosmic microwave background radiation, can only be explained using the Big Bang Theory. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening.